So uh, now we're going to shift gears to our second session. Um, so this, uh, this next session is uh, kind of picking up uh, on, on some elements that uh, Kathy Greenlee uh, spoke about uh, earlier. Uh, the, the title is um, State uh, Perspectives on Aging and Long-Term Services and Supports. Uh, and we're delighted to welcome several speakers uh, for this session. I'll introduce each of them now and then uh, each, each person will have about 20 minutes to speak to you, uh, and we'll, we're hoping for a few minutes at the end for Q&A. Uh, so our first speaker is Susan Tucker. Uh, she possesses extensive long-term services and supports uh, operational compliance and financial expertise for programs at the local, state, and national level. Uh, she's a principal with uh, Health Management Associates, uh, which is a national consulting firm, uh, and she's um, She's uh, kindly traveled to Colorado today uh, to join us. Um, she has a deep understanding of managed care and the legal, financial, and administrative requirements providers must navigate. And prior to joining Health Management Associates, she served uh, in vice president roles related to strategy, long-term services and supports, and Medicare, Medicaid dual integration programs. She earned a bachelor's degree in accounting from the University of South Florida and is a certified public accountant licensed in the state of Florida. Uh, our second speaker will be Haley Gleason. Uh, Haley is uh, a gerontologist with expertise in aging policy, long-term care, and the direct care workforce. Prior to her current role as the older adult policy advisor at the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, that is Colorado's Medicaid uh, department, if you're not familiar, uh, Haley served as the interim executive director Executive Director and Assistant Executive Director of the Home Care Aid Council. She also previously held the position of Associate Executive Director at the Palisades at Broadmoor Park, an independent assisted living and memory care community in Colorado Springs. Uh, Haley has extensive experience working on community-based efforts to improve services for older adults, working as a researcher and project director for the Age-Friendly Boston Initiative for the Center for Social and Demographic Research on Aging within the Gerontology Institute at UMass Boston. And Haley is currently a doctoral candidate in gerontology at UMass Boston, where her research focuses on the recruitment, retention, training, and supervision of the home care aid workforce. Uh, our final speaker in this session is John Emerson. Uh, and John uh, has been working at the intersection of healthcare, consumer empowerment, and innovation for 15 years at successful companies, including Relay Health, McKeeson, Healthline, Health Grades, and Silver Sneakers. John has led two Webby winning product teams and his products have been used by tens of millions of users. John joined the Strategic Action Planning Group on Aging here in Colorado two years ago and has just been nominated to the Executive and Healthcare Committees. He also serves as Deputy Ambassador to Aging 2.0 Denver. Uh, he has degrees from Harvard and UC Berkeley and lives in the Park Hill section of Denver with his wife and two sons. Uh, without further ado, I will welcome Susan Tucker to the stage. Thanks. Yeah, the clicker, I don't see it. But anyway, let me um, just say thanks really quickly for the opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, I, I love Colorado. Oh, thank you. Um, I come from a slightly warmer climate, so this gave me an opportunity to wear my turtleneck. Um, but let me just add a couple things, just so you know my background. I worked at a um, community-based organization, not-for-profit organization that provided care for persons who are elderly and with physical disabilities. We were one of the first uh, Meals on Wheels programs in the country and one of the first daycare centers we opened in the country. So they had been around for a long time. I also worked as deputy secretary at the state unit on aging in the state of Florida. So I, was, I, I worked at the provider level and at the funding level and I also worked at the auditor regulator level. So I've got you know, experience from different aspects. So I hope that offers a good perspective. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is really um, keys in a lot on what Kathy was mentioning. And I think it gives us some hope as to see what some of the trends are in the states in terms of what's happening with long-term services and supports. 
so what we'll talk about is um, the landscape and the populations with the, with the special challenges. Make sure we can, okay. Integrating care between Medicaid and Medicare, that's a real challenge, and that's been a trend for a number of years at the federal level as well as at some of the states that are doing that. Value-based payment for long-term services and supports, and Kathy mentioned that. It's been harder for value to be calculated, if we will, for providing long-term services and supports, because how can you calculate maintaining somebody healthy in the home? You know, it's not going to be an acute episode where they get better. We're going to keep them safely at home. And so how do you calculate that? And I remember talking to legislative committees about nursing home avoidance. Well, they couldn't get it. How do you measure avoidance of nursing home care? So that's been a little bit slower to, to kick in for value-based payment for long-term services and supports. And then we'll talk about social determinants of health. That's a big buzzword now for which many of you have been providing this care for many, many years. And then the workforce, Kathy also talked about that, and what it, what's happening among the states to do um, to address the workforce shortages we're seeing. But first I want to give you a little bit of a landscape because it does, it does boil down to money. Um, it really does. And so Medicaid is the largest payer of long-term services and supports. And what is LTSS? But before I go further, how many of you are actually providing care you know, in, as a provider or with aging, um, every agency on aging. I just want to get a sense of the audience. Is it, and then how many of you are interested in aging services and may work in other sectors and other industries? Okay, that's helpful. So long-term services and supports is really a broad range of services needed by people who have limitations. And so these would be services that address their needs to remain safely in the home for self-care, and they may have physical or cognitive deficits that need to be addressed. So I know this map is hard to read, but what you can get a sense is this map shows LTSS spend expenditures as a percentage of total Medicaid expenditures. And Medicaid being the largest payer of LTSS is important to pay attention to. The darker states are the ones with a higher percentage. North Dakota at 53%. Arizona is at 15.9%. Colorado's right in the middle at about 30%. It's been ticking around 29%, 30%. So what is driving these um, Medicaid expenditures? So what we, what we see in these two graphs is expenditure growth. The one on the left is the LTSS expenditure growth as a whole, and that's a, that includes home and community-based care, but also includes nursing facility care. So you see the steady rise, but it ticks slightly down for 2016. And what is driving that growth is the HCBS expenditure growth, and you see that on the right-hand side, at 10%. And so what we see is this spending rose more, this HCBS spending rose more in 2016 than in any other year in the current decade. So all of that growth in the long-term care is in home and community based. So what's driving that, what we're seeing in the home and community based? And so this is a graph showing um, what states are doing. And so this is based on a recent survey um, done by all the, uh, surveyed all the Medicaid um, states, all the officials in each of the states to find out what is it they're doing. And primarily there's home and community based waivers and state plan amendments. Those are the federal authorities by which Medicaid can provide home and community-based services. They're also building rebalancing initiatives, balancing that expenditure level between nursing facility care and community-based care. So we see the tick more toward community-based care. PACE expansion, we had the lady here talking about PACE, the program for all-inclusive care for the elderly. We're seeing 20, almost half states have PACE programs, which is a day center model and provides clinical care as well as day center transportation and meals. It's a very nice model. We're seeing less and less closures in institutions because that was a trend a number of years ago. So there's only about nine states doing that. So out of all these expansions, you know, there's about 48, 47 states that are doing things and none of the states have done anything to restrict access to home and community-based care. So that's a really exciting trend to see. 
So what are the populations that really present a challenge? Older individuals, certainly, but also individuals with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. As they're getting older, their caregivers are also getting older and may be less able to care for them or passing away, and so who will take care of those persons with DD? And also the LGBTQ community, who's um, taking care of these individuals, because they're often very um, much more socially isolated, more than twice as likely to be single, and they don't have as many options for informal caregiving. Aren't you glad I don't have a whole hour to talk? <laughs> No, this is exciting stuff. We'll get through some of this, and then it'll be a little more exciting about what, what we're doing. So this is the dual eligibles, and you hear a lot of talk about duals, and that's those individuals who are um, eligible for both Medicaid and Medicare. And these individuals are typically sicker, have more chronic conditions, have lower income, um, have less health literacy, um, and less education. So they're a very vulnerable population, and um, there's a lot of emphasis been um, placed on how do we care for individuals who are duly eligible. So one of the first trends among the states I wanted to talk about is integrating care between Medicaid and Medicare. And that's been going on for a number of years through at the federal level. CMS has provided for demonstrations um, to help provide a little bit better care coordination um, for services and benefits because, as you know, Medicaid covers those long-term care services. Medicare covers more of the acute and medical. And so where, how do you coordinate that? Where is that handoff? As Kathy was talking about the transition between hospital and home, how do you integrate that care? And so these financial alignment demonstrations were intended to help um, show good outcomes and many times, efforts on the side of the home and community-based services, preventing falls, preventing acute episodes, preventing hospital admi admissions, all of that savings accrues on the Medicare side. And so the intent was to show that there is savings to be had, better outcomes, and for the states to actually share in some of that savings. Another trend that we're seeing is through um, Medicare Advantage plans or the duly eligible special needs plans. And those are a specialized type of special needs plan. And you'll see in that far right-hand box, FIDE SNPs, fully integrated dual eligible SNPs. And this is a little bit different um, take on what a DSNP is. And what it is is um, it's a Medicare and Medicaid product under a single health plan. And this offers the same payer, the same um, set of providers, the same care management providing care for an individual to help coordinate the benefits between both of these programs. There's also a new thing, um, it's a DSNP also, and it's called a high DSNP, and it'll be coming online in 2021. This is a highly integrated dual eligible SNP. And I say that by way of saying that the the federal government is recognizing the need to provide mechanisms, as Kathy was talking about, opportunities for which we can actually avail ourselves to see if some of these things will take um, better care of, of um, persons who are aging and who need long-term services and supports. And so this Heidi SNP is a little bit different in that it, it's a contract with the state and it provides primary long-term care um, and acute care under one health plan, one Medicare Advantage health plan. So again, at the federal level, this is CMS. They're really recognizing the need. And I think this is beginning to, to, to really be the exciting part to where there's, there is more recognition, silver lining, positive, you know, the glass is half full. <clears throat> CMS is beginning to recognize the need to really provide mechanisms by which states can develop programs that provide better outcomes for long-term services and supports. There's been two recent letters to state, to state Medicaid um, directors offering them a list of opportunities by which they can avail themselves to really develop some programs that are funded through Medicaid to help care for individuals and give them better outcomes. Now, 
there was one that came out last December that has 10 opportunities. The one that came out just this past April has three different opportunities. And one of them is the um, capitated financial alignment arrangement, which is what I was just talking about, that, that demonstration that many states are doing to provide that integrated care between Medicaid and Medicare. They're saying, okay, there's an opportunity. You can continue to do that. There's also the opportunity to do the managed fee-for-service model, which is what Colorado has participated in. Colorado and Washington both participated in this type of model. And so they're saying, look, there's an opportunity. Look at the good outcomes that came out of Washington. Maybe you can take that and see what you can do with that type of model. And then the third opportunity was where they said new state-specific opportunities. So the state can go to the federal government, to the CMS, and say, look, we have a great idea. And a lot of these great ideas start at this level, at the foundation level, at the area agency level, at the county level, and you can take it to the state. States are really great innovators, great laboratories for developing programs that work and to show good outcomes. But that's been the challenge, is to show the, the outcomes and to collect the data at the area agency, at the community-based level. And very recently, a couple of states did just announce that they are going to avail themselves of these opportunities. It was Illinois. They're going to take advantage of that um, financial alignment demonstration. They're going to extend it for them. Now, what California has announced is they're not going to continue doing um, that financial alignment demonstration, but instead they're going to require all of their health plans to also provide a DSNP or Medicare Advantage plan so that those individuals can enroll in both plans and get coordinated care. So there really are opportunities um, for states to um, recognize the needs, the particular needs of their um, citizens. Um, and so you can see that uh, um, I think CMS is more and more willing to um, take a look and to approve these different types of authorities. And in fact, um, CMS did just approve uh, uh, an 1115 waiver, which is a, is a type of, a, of an authority for the District of Columbia to provide um, a little bit different take on providing care for behavioral health um, needs for its um, residents. Now here's some models, and there's a bunch of different models out there. These are all primarily managed care models, which is a risk-based model, where you have a traditional contract, you'll have the Medicare Advantage contract, and you'll have both of those under one health plan, and that offers the opportunity to have better um, coordination for the benefits as well as for um, any community-based care that may be needed. There's also the opportunity to have um, um, the FIDE SNPs, and then as you know, we go along, we'll see probably more um, HIDE SNPs, the highly integrated dual eligible SNPs. And I know there's a lot of acronyms, so I'm trying to, to say that what they are as I, as I use those acronyms. And then there's also a lot of PACE expansion, um, which is exciting. I've been, um, been able to be involved in a number of organizations that developed PACE programs which is really an exciting program for the community. It's usually smaller numbers of individuals who are, um, belong to these um, PACE organizations, but they do provide a great um, a holistic care for the individual. Now, what's not listed on here is the accountable care organizations, and there are a number of states that have those. I think 12 states have them. There's going to be another 10. Colorado is one of the states that has an accountable care organization type model. Massachusetts just was, a couple of years ago, was approved for an ACO model. And that's where they can have um, three different types of, of accountable care partnerships, whether it's through the primary care accountable care organization or a managed care with um, an accountable care organization. So there's a lot of variations that can be adapted to meet the needs of your, of your residents and your needs in your community. I mentioned the duly eligible individuals. Um, there's about 12 million of them, and so what we're seeing more and more is that these individuals are enrolling in Medicare Advantage. That's the managed care 
um, part of Medicare, not the traditional. So we're seeing more and more becoming um, enrolled in Medicare Advantage, and this gives the opportunity to maybe provide a little bit better coordination between Medicaid and Medicare. I just got the five minute, um, which is good, thank you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed up a little bit. This is just showing the states that have um, managed long-term care programs in them. Um, the dark purple are the states to watch that may have um, managed care activity coming online in the next couple of, of years. Value-based payments. I want to hit on this really quickly. Kathy was talking about transitions of care. This is something that is being part of value-based care, meaning purchasing for value, not based on volume. And so um, Colorado has an initiative um, called, what is it called? The Hospital Transformation Program, and that really helps with transitioning individuals, whether it be from the hospital to home, hospital to nursing home. There's a lot of opportunity to improve care um, and to prevent rehospitalizations. We're seeing more and more um, Programs come out with value-based for long-term services and supports, even though it's been a little bit harder for um, providers of LTSS to measure and collect data to be able to report on outcomes that can be measured and, um, and uh, paid through a value-based system. Your neighbors to the south in um, New Mexico, they recognize that. We were talking about the demographics. New Mexico is ranked, I think, at like 46 in, in terms of um, um, individuals over the age of 65 in 2010 and 2030. They'll be ranked at number four. So they've really got to do something. And so their value-based purchasing um, is built into their um, Centennial Care 2.0 contract, where by um, the fourth year, they'll have almost 36% in value-based care. So let's talk a little bit about social determinants of health. Kathy mentioned that. The WHO, WHO World Health Organization describes um, social determinants as the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age. And I agree that food insecurity is one of the major um, uh, social determinants or, or social risk factors, and that's something that can be addressed um, and is being addressed, I'm, I'm really happy to say. And another social determinant is housing. How many, um, how many of you may be working with housing organizations for affordable housing? Oh, good. I'm glad to see that. Oops, let me back up. I do want to say real quick, I want to call out that little bubble over there. Over a third of the states now are reporting social determinants of health data. And that's really positive news because that'll help with determining um, what the benefits can be, care management, quality performance, and that kind of thing. So if you, if you measure it, then at least you can do something about it. Housing-related services, 37 states are reporting in 2019 and 2020 that they're doing something related to housing. 2020, 13 states are going to be implementing something um, around housing. So if you don't have stable, affordable housing, you're not going to be able to take care of yourself. Um, in terms of health outcomes, you know, getting good nutritious food, taking your meds. Housing is one of the very primary um, uh, social determinants in my mind, other than food insecurity. I brought these up if you want to look at the slides later. These are two examples, and this is just where they're examples of state Medicaid agencies that are talking to their counterparts in the housing agencies. And they're really finding opportunities to collaborate. Because continuum of care in our world, that term means something very, very different in the housing world. And so having that um, collaboration between housing organizations and organizations that provide care for long-term services and supports, I think, is very valuable. Direct workforce, Kathy mentioned this too, we're all aging, we're getting older as a country at a very rapid pace, we're having shortages, we don't have as many caregivers um, to take care, whether it's informal or formal. So we're seeing a lot of states um, addressing this issue. 25 states in 2019 were having wage increases for Medicaid reimbursed direct care workers. And also, um, for workforce development, whether that's training or mentoring or, or special programs for uh, career development. 
Okay, good timing. <laughs> he just put the zero up, zero out of time. Woo! <laughs> I went through that fast, so if there's any questions, I'm going to be around all day. I'm happy to share anything I might know. Thank you.